Chapter Sixteen of Cabbages and Kings by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eric Metzler. Rouge et Noir. It has been indicated that disaffection followed the elevation of Losada to the presidency. This feeling continued to grow. Throughout the entire republic there seemed to be a spirit of silent, sullen discontent. Even the old liberal party to which Goodwin, Zavala, and other patriots had lent their aid was disappointed. Losada had failed to become a popular idol. Fresh taxes, fresh import duties, and, more than all, his tolerance of the outrageous oppression of citizens by the military had rendered him the most obnoxious president since the despicable Alforan. The majority of his own cabinet were out of sympathy with him. The army, which he had courted by giving it license to tyrannize, had been his main and thus far adequate support. But the most impolitic of the administration's moves had been when it antagonized the Vesuvius Fruit Company, an organization plying twelve steamers, and with a cash capital somewhat larger than Anchuria's surplus and debt combined. Reasonably, an established concern like the Vesuvius would become irritated at having a small retail republic with no rating at all attempt to squeeze it. So when the government proxies applied for a subsidy they encountered a polite refusal. The president at once retaliated by clapping an export duty of one real per bunch on bananas, a thing unprecedented in fruit-growing countries. The Vesuvius Company had invested large sums in wharves and plantations along the Anchurian coast. Their agents had erected fine homes in the towns where they had their headquarters, and heretofore had worked with the Republic in goodwill and with advantage to both. It would lose an immense sum if compelled to move out. The selling price of bananas from Veracruz to Trinidad was three reals per bunch. This new duty of one real would have ruined the fruit growers in Anchuria and have seriously discommoded the Vesuvius Company had it declined to pay it. But for some reason the Vesuvius continued to buy Anchurian fruit, paying four reals for it, and not suffering the growers to bear the loss. This apparent victory deceived His Excellency and he began to hunger for more of it. He sent an emissary to request a conference with a representative of the fruit company. The Vesuvius sent Mr. Franzoni, a little stout cheerful man, always cool, and whistling airs from Verdi's operas. Signor Spiritione, of the office of the Minister of Finance, attempted the sandbagging in behalf of Anchuria. The meeting took place in the cabin of the Salvador, of the Vesuvius line. Signor Spirition opened negotiations by announcing that the government contemplated the building of a railroad to skirt the alluvial coastlands. After touching upon the benefit such a road would confer upon the interests of the Vesuvius, he reached the definite suggestion that a contribution to the road's expenses of, say, fifty thousand pesos would not be more than an equivalent to benefits received. Mr. Franzoni denied that his company would receive any benefits from a contemplated road. As its representative, he must decline to contribute fifty thousand pesos, but he would assume the responsibility of offering twenty-five. Did Signor Spiritione understand Signor Franzoni to mean twenty-five thousand pesos? By no means. Twenty-five pesos. And in silver, not in gold. Your offer insults my government, cried Signor Spiritione, rising with indignation. Then, said Mr. Franzoni, in warning tone, we will change it. The offer was never changed. Could Mr. Franzoni have meant the government? This was the state of affairs in Anchuria when the winter season opened at Coralio at the end of the second year of Losada's administration. So when the government and society made its annual exodus to the seashore, it was evident that the presidential advent would not be celebrated by unlimited rejoicing. The 10th of November was the day set for the entrance into Coralio of the gay company from the capital. A narrow-gauge railroad runs twenty miles into the interior from Solitas. The government party travels by carriage from San Mateo to this road's terminal point, and proceeds by train to Solitas. From here they march in grand procession to Coralio, where, on the day of their coming, festivities and ceremonies abound. But this season saw an ominous dawning of the 10th of November. Although the rainy season was over, the day seemed to hark back to reeking June. A fine drizzle of rain fell all during the forenoon. The procession entered Coralio amid a strange silence. 
President Losada was an elderly man, grizzly-bearded, with a considerable ratio of Indian blood revealed in his cinnamon complexion. His carriage headed the procession, surrounded and guarded by Captain Cruz and his famous troop of one hundred light horse, El Ciento Huyando. Colonel Rocas followed, with a regiment of the regular army. The President's sharp, beady eyes glanced about him for the expected demonstration of welcome, but he faced a stolid, indifferent array of citizens. Sightseers, the Anchurians, are by birth and habit, and they turned out to their last able-bodied unit to witness the scene but they maintained an accusive silence. They crowded the streets to the very wheel-ruts. They covered the red tile roofs to the eaves, but there was never a viva from them. No wreaths of palm and lemon branches or gorgeous strings of paper roses hung from the windows and balconies as was the custom. There was an apathy, a dull dissenting disapprobation, that was the more ominous because it puzzled. No one feared an outburst, a revolt of the discontents, for they had no leader. The President and those loyal to him had never even heard whispered a name among them capable of crystallizing the dissatisfaction into opposition. No, there could be no danger. The people always procured a new idol before they destroyed an old one. At length, after a prodigious galloping and curvetting of red-sashed majors, gold-laced colonels and epauletted generals, the procession formed for its annual progress down the Calle Grande to the Casa Morena, where the ceremony of welcome to the visiting president always took place. The Swiss band led the line of march. After it pranced the local commandante, mounted, and with a detachment of his troops. Next came a carriage with four members of the cabinet, conspicuous among them the minister of war, old General Pilar, with his white moustache and his soldierly bearing. Then the President's vehicle, containing also the ministers of finance and state, and surrounded by Captain Cruz's light horse formed in a close double file of fours. Following them, the rest of the officials of state, the judges and distinguished military and social ornaments of public and private life. As the band struck up, and the movement began, like a bird of ill omen, the Valhalla, the swiftest steamship of the Vesuvius line, glided into the harbor in plain view of the president and his train. Of course, there was nothing menacing about its arrival. A business firm does not go to war with a nation. But it reminded Senor Espiritión and others in those carriages that the Vesuvius Fruit Company was undoubtedly carrying something up its sleeve for them. By the time the van of the procession had reached the government building, Captain Cronin of the Valhalla and Mr. Vincenti, member of the Vesuvius Company, had landed and were pushing their way, bluff, hearty, and nonchalant, through the crowd on the narrow sidewalk, clad in white linen, big, debonair, with an air of good-humoured authority, they made conspicuous figures among the dark mass of unimposing Anchurians, as they penetrated to within a few yards of the steps of the Casa Morena. Looking easily above the heads of the crowd, they perceived another that towered above the undersized natives. It was the fiery pole of Dicky Maloney against the wall close by the lower step, and his broad, seductive grin showed that he recognized their presence. Dicky had attired himself becomingly for the festive occasion in a well-fitting black suit. Pasa was close by his side, her head covered with the ubiquitous black mantilla. Mr. Vincenti looked at her attentively. Botticelli's Madonna, he remarked gravely. I wonder when she got into the game. I don't like his getting tangled with the women. I hoped he would keep away from them." Captain Cronin's laugh almost drew attention from the parade. "'With that head of hair, keep away from the women, and a Maloney? Hasn't he got a license? But, nonsense aside, what do you think of the prospects? It's a species of filibustering out of my line.' Vincenti glanced again at Dickie's head and smiled. Rouge et Noir, he said. There you have it. Make your play, gentlemen. Our money is on the red. The lad's game, said Cronin, with a commanding look at the tall, easy figure by the steps. But tis all like fly-by-night theatricals to me. The talk's bigger than the stage. There's a smell of gasoline in the air, and they're their own audience and scene-shifters. They ceased talking, for General Pilar had descended from the first carriage and had taken his stand upon the top step of Casa Morena. 
as the oldest member of the cabinet custom had decreed that he should make the address of welcome presenting the keys of the official residence to the president at its close general pilar was one of the most distinguished citizens of the republic he wrote three wars and innumerable revolutions he was an honored guest at european courts and camps an eloquent speaker and a friend to the people he represented the highest type of the anchurians holding in his hand the gilt keys of casa morena he began his address in a historical form touching upon each administration and the advance of civilization and prosperity from the first dim striving after liberty down to present times arriving at the regime of president lozada at which point according to precedent he should have delivered a eulogy upon its wise conduct and the happiness of the people general pilar paused then he silently held up the bunch of keys high above his head with his eyes closely regarding it the ribbon with which they were bound fluttered in the breeze it still blows cried the speaker exultantly citizens of anchuria give thanks to the saints this night that our air is still free thus disposing of losada's administration he abruptly reverted to that of olivara anchuria's most popular ruler olivara had been assassinated nine years before while in the prime of life and usefulness a faction of the liberal party led by losada himself had been accused of the deed whether guilty or not it was eight years before the ambitious and scheming losada had gained his goal upon this theme general pilar's eloquence was loosed he drew the picture of the beneficent olivara with a loving hand he reminded the people of the peace the security and the happiness they had enjoyed during that period he recalled in vivid detail and with significant contrast the last winter sojourn of president olivara in corralio when his appearance at their fiestas was the signal for thundering vivas of love and approbation the first public expression of sentiment from the people that day followed a low sustained murmur went among them like the surf rolling along the shore ten dollars to a dinner at the st charles remarked mr vincenti that rouge wins i never bet against my own interests said captain cronin lighting a cigar long-winded old boy for his age what's he talking about my spanish replied vincenti runs about ten words to the minute his is something around two hundred whatever he's saying he's getting them warmed up friends and brothers general pilar was saying could i reach out my hand this day across the lamentable silence of the grave to olivara the good to the ruler who was one of you whose tears fell when you sorrowed and whose smile followed your joy i would bring him back to you but olivara is dead dead at the hands of a craven assassin the speaker turned and gazed boldly into the carriage of the president his arm remained extended aloft as if to sustain his peroration the president was listening aghast at this remarkable address of welcome he was sunk back upon his seat trembling with rage and dumb surprise his dark hands tightly gripping the carriage cushions half rising he extended one arm toward the speaker and shouted a harsh command at captain cruz the leader of the flying hundred sat on his horse immovable with folded arms giving no sign of having heard losada sank back again his dark features distinctly paling who says that olivara is dead suddenly cried the speaker his voice old as he was sounding like a battle trumpet his body lies in the grave but to the people he loved he has bequeathed his spirit yes more his learning his courage his kindness yes more his youth his image people of anchuria have you forgotten ramon the son of olivara cronin and vincenti watching closely saw dicky maloney suddenly raise his hat tear off his shock of red hair leap up the steps and stand at the side of general pilar the minister of war laid his arm across the young man's shoulders all who had known president olivara saw again his same lion-like pose the same frank undaunted expression the same high forehead with the peculiar line of the clustering crisp black hair general pilar was an experienced orator he seized the moment of breathless silence that preceded the storm citizens of anchuria he trumpeted holding aloft the keys to casa morena 
I am here to deliver these keys, the keys to your homes and liberty, to your chosen president. Shall I deliver them to Enrico Olivares' assassin, or to his son? Olivara, Olivara, the crowd shrieked and howled. All vociferated the magic name, men, women, children, and the parrots. And the enthusiasm was not confined to the blood of the plebs. Colonel Rocas ascended the steps and laid his sword theatrically at young Ramon Olivares' feet. Four members of the cabinet embraced him. Captain Cruz gave a command, and twenty of El Ciento Huillando dismounted and arranged themselves in a cordon about the steps of Casa Morena. But Ramon Olivares seized that moment to prove himself a born genius and politician. He waved those soldiers aside and descended the steps to the street. There, without losing his dignity or the distinguished elegance that the loss of his red hair brought him, he took the proletariat to his bosom, the barefooted, the dirty, Indians, Caribs, babies, beggars, old, young, saints, soldiers, and sinners. He missed none of them. While this act of the drama was being presented, the scene-shifters had been busy at the duties that had been assigned to them. Two of Cruz's dragoons had seized the bridle reins of Losada's horses. Others formed a close guard around the carriage, and they galloped off with the tyrant and his two unpopular ministers. No doubt a place had been prepared for them. There are a number of well-barred stone apartments in Coralio. "'Rouge winds,' said Mr. Vincenti, calmly lighting another cigar. Captain Cronin had been intently watching the vicinity of the stone steps for some time. "'Good boy!' he exclaimed suddenly, as if relieved. I wondered if he was going to forget his Kathleen Mavournin. Young Olivara had reascended the steps and spoken a few words to General Pilar. Then that distinguished veteran descended to the ground and approached Pasa, who still stood, wonder-eyed, where Dickie had left her. With his plumed hat in his hand and his medals and decorations shining on his breast, the general spoke to her and gave her his arm and they went up the stone steps of the Casa Morena together. And then Ramon Olivara stepped forward and took both her hands before all the people. And while the cheering was breaking out afresh everywhere, Captain Cronin and Mr. Vincenti turned and walked back toward the shore where the gig was waiting for them. "'There will be another Presidente Proclamada in the morning,' said Mr. Vincenti, musingly. "'As a rule they are not as reliable as the elected ones,' but this youngster seems to have some good stuff in him. He planned and maneuvered the entire campaign. Olivara's widow, you know, was wealthy. After her husband was assassinated, she went to the States and educated her son at Yale. The Vesuvius Company hunted him up and backed him in the little game. "'It's a glorious thing,' said Cronin, half-jestingly, "'to be able to discharge a government and insert one of your own choosing in these days.' "'Oh, it is only a matter of business,' said Vincenti, stopping and offering the stump of his cigar to a monkey that swung down from a lime-tree. "'And this is what moves the world of to-day. That extra real on the price of bananas had to go. We took the shortest way of removing it.'" End of chapter 15 Recording by Eric Metzler, Albuquerque, New Mexico, United States of America Chapter Seventeen of Cabbages and Kings by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eric Metzler. Two Recalls. There remains three duties to be performed before the curtain falls upon the patched comedy. Two have been promised. The third is no less obligatory. It was set forth in the program of this tropic vaudeville that it would be made known why Shorty O'Day of the Columbia Detective Agency lost his position. Also that Smith should come again to tell us what mystery he followed that night on the shores of Anchuria when he strewed so many cigar stumps around the coconut palm during his lonely night vigil on the beach. These things were promised, but a bigger thing yet remains to be accomplished, the clearing up of a seeming wrong that has been done according to the array of chronicled facts, truthfully set forth, that have been presented and one voice, speaking, shall do these three things. Two men sat on a stringer of a North River pier in the city of New York. 
a steamer from the tropics had begun to unload bananas and oranges on the pier. Now and then a banana or two would fall from an overripe bunch, and one of the two men would shamble forward, seize the fruit, and return to share it with his companion. One of the men was in the ultimate state of deterioration. As far as rain and wind and sun could wreck the garments he wore, it had been done. In his person the ravages of drink were as plainly visible, and yet upon his high-bridged, rubicund nose was jauntily perched a pair of shining and flawless gold-rimmed glasses. The other man was not so far gone upon the descending highway of the incompetence. Truly the flower of his manhood had gone to seed, seed that perhaps no soil might sprout. But there were still cross-cuts along where he travelled through which he might yet regain the pathway of usefulness without disturbing the slumbering miracles. This man was short and compactly built. He had an oblique dead eye like that of a stingray, and the moustache of a cocktail mixer. We know the eye and the moustache. We know that smith of the luxurious yacht, the gorgeous raiment, the mysterious mission, the magic disappearance, has come again, though shorn of the accessories of his former state. At his third banana, the man with the nose-glasses spat it from him with a shudder. "'Tis take all fruit,' he remarked, in a patrician tone of disgust. "'I lived for two years where these things grow. The memory of their taste lingers with you. The oranges are not so bad. Just see if you can gather a couple of them, O'Day, when the next broken crate comes up.' "'Did you live down with the monkeys?' asked the other, made tepidly garrulous by the sunshine and the alleviating meal of juicy fruit. "'I was down there once myself, but only for a few hours.' That was when I was with the Columbia Detective Agency. The monkey people did me up. I'd have my job yet if it hadn't been for them. I'll tell you about it. One day the chief sent a note around to the office that read, Send O'Day here at once for a big piece of business. I was the crack detective of the agency at that time. They always handed me the big jobs. The address the chief wrote was from down in the Wall Street district. When I got there I found him in a private office with a lot of directors who were looking pretty fuzzy. They stated the case. The president of the Republic Insurance Company had skipped with about a tenth of a million dollars in cash. The directors wanted him back pretty bad, but they wanted the money worse. They said they needed it. They had traced the old gent's movements to where he boarded a tramp fruit steamer bound for South America that same morning with his daughter and a big grip sack. All the family he had. One of the directors had his steam yacht cold and with steam up, ready for the trip, and he turned her over to me, carte blanche. In four hours I was on board of her and hot on the trail of the fruit tub. I had a pretty good idea where old Warfield, that was his name, J. Churchill Warfield, would head for. At that time we had a treaty with about every foreign country except Belgium and that banana republic, Anchuria. There wasn't a photo of old Warfield to be had in New York. He had been foxy there. But I had his description. And besides, the lady with him would be a dead giveaway anywhere. She was one of the high flyers in society. Not the kind that have their pictures in the Sunday papers, but the real sort that open chrysanthemum shows and christen battleships. Well, sir, we never got a sight of that fruit tub on the road. The ocean is a pretty big place, and I guess we took different paths across it but we kept going toward this Anchuria, where the fruiter was bound for. We struck the monkey coast one afternoon about four. There was a ratty-looking steamer offshore taking on bananas. The monkeys were loading her up with big barges. It might be the one the old man had taken, and it might not. I went ashore to look around. The scenery was pretty good. I never saw any finer on the New York stage. I struck an American on shore, a big cool chap, standing around with the monkeys. He showed me the consul's office. The consul was a nice young fellow. He said the fruiter was the Carlsofin, running generally to New Orleans, but took her last cargo to New York. Then I was sure my people were on board, although everybody told me that no passengers had landed. I didn't think they would land until after dark, for they might have been shy about it on account of seeing that yacht of mine hanging around. So all I had to do was to wait and nab em when they came ashore. I couldn't arrest old Warfield without extradition papers, but my play was to get the cash. They generally give up if you strike them when they're tired and rattled and short on nerve. After dark I sat under a coconut tree on the beach for a while, 
and then I walked around and investigated that town some, and it was enough to give you the lions. If a man could stay in New York and be honest, he'd better do it than to hit that monkey town with a million. Dinky little mud houses, grass over your shoe tops in the streets, ladies in low neck and short sleeves walking around smoking cigars, tree frogs rattling like a horse cart going to a ten blow, big mountains dropping gravel in the backyards, and the sea licking the paint off in front. No, sir, a man had better be in God's country living on free lunch than there. The main street ran along the beach, and I walked down it, and then turned up a kind of lane where the houses were made of poles and straw. I wanted to see what the monkeys did when they weren't climbing coconut trees. The very first shack I looked in I saw my people. They must have come ashore while I was promenading. A man about fifty, smooth face, heavy eyebrows, dressed in black broadcloth, looking like he was just about to say, "'Can any little boy in the Sunday school answer that?' He was freezing on to a grip that weighed like a dozen gold bricks, and a swell girl, a regular peach with a Fifth Avenue cut, was sitting on a wooden chair. An old black woman was fixing some coffee and beans on a table. The light that they had come from a lantern hung on a nail. I went and stood in the door, and they looked at me, and I said, "'Mr. Warfield, you are my prisoner. I hope, for the lady's sake, you will take the matter sensibly. You know why I want you.' "'Who are you?' says the old gent. O'Day, says I, of the Columbia Detective Agency. And now, sir, let me give you a piece of good advice. You go back and take your medicine like a man. Hand him back the boodle, and maybe they'll let you off light. Go back easy, and I'll put in a word for you. I'll give you five minutes to decide. I pulled out my watch and waited. Then the young lady chipped in. She was one of the genuine high-steppers. You could tell by the way her clothes fit and the style she had that Fifth Avenue was made for her. Come inside she says. Don't stand in the door and disturb the whole street with that suit of clothes. Now, what is it you want? Three minutes gone, I said. I'll tell you again while the other two tick off. You'll admit being the President of the Republic, won't you? I am, says he. Well, then, says I, it ought to be plain to you. Wanted in New York, J. Churchill Warfield, President of the Republic Insurance Company. Also the funds belonging to said company, now in that grip, in the unlawful possession of said J. Churchill Warfield. Oh, says the young lady, as if she was thinking, you want to take us back to New York. To take Mr. Warfield, there's no charge against you, miss. There will be no objection, of course, to your returning with your father. Of a sudden the girl gave a tiny scream and grabbed the old boy around the neck. Oh, father, father, she says, kind of contralto, can this be true? Have you taken money that is not yours? Speak, father. It made you shiver to hear the tremolo stop she put on her voice. The old boy looked pretty bughouse when she first grappled him, but she went on whispering in his ear and patting his off shoulder till he stood still, but sweating a little. She got him to one side and they talked together a minute, and then he put on some gold eyeglasses and walked up and handed me the grip. Mr. Detective, he says, talking a little broken, I conclude to return with you. I have finished to discover that life on this desolate and displeased coast would be worse than to die itself. I will go back and hurl myself upon the mercy of the Republic Company. Have you brought a sheep? Sheep, says I, haven't a single. Ship, cut in the young lady. Don't get funny. Father's of German birth and doesn't speak perfect English. How did you come? The girl was all broke up. She had a handkerchief to her face and kept saying every little bit, Oh, father, father. She walked up to me and laid her lily-white hand on the clothes that had pained her at first. I smelt a million violets. She was a lulu. I told her I came in a private yacht. "'Mr. O'Day,' she says, "'oh, take us away from this hard country at once. Can you, will you, say you will?' "'I'll try,' I said, concealing the fact that I was dying to get them on salt water before they could change their mind. One thing they both kicked against was going through the town to the boat landing said they dreaded publicity, and now that they were going to return, they had a hope that the thing might yet be kept out of the papers. They swore they wouldn't go unless I got them out to the yacht without anyone knowing it. So I agreed to humor them. The sailors who rowed me ashore were playing billiards in a bar-room near the water, waiting for orders, and I proposed to have them take the boat down the beach half a mile or so, and take us up there. How to get them word was the question, for I couldn't leave the grip with the prisoner, and I couldn't take it with me, not knowing but what the monkeys might stick me up. 
the young lady says the old colored woman would take them a note i sat down and wrote it and gave it to the dame with plain directions what to do and she grins like a baboon and shakes her head then mr warfield handed her a string of foreign dialect and she nods her head and says si sí, senor maybe fifty times and lights out with the note old augusta only understands german said miss warfield smiling at me we stopped in her house to ask where we could find lodging and she insisted upon our having coffee she tells us she was raised in a german family in san domingo very likely i said but you can search me for german words except nix verst day and noch einst i would have called that si senor french though on a gamble well we three made a sneak around the edge of town so as not to be seen we got tangled in vines and ferns and the banana bushes and tropical scenery a good deal the monkey suburbs was as wild as places in central park we came out on the beach a good half mile below a brown chap was lying asleep under a coconut tree with a ten-foot musket beside him mr warfield takes up the gun and pitches it into the sea the coast is guarded he says rebellion and plots ripen like fruit he pointed to the sleeping man who never stirred thus he says they perform trusts children i saw our boat coming and i struck a match and lit a piece of newspaper to show them where we were in thirty minutes we were on board the yacht the first thing mr warfield and his daughter and i took the grip into the owner's cabin opened it up and took an inventory there was one hundred and five thousand dollars united states treasury notes in it besides a lot of diamond jewelry and a couple of hundred havana cigars i gave the old man the cigars and a receipt for the rest of the lot as agent for the company and locked the stuff up in my private quarters i never had a pleasanter trip than that one after we got to see the young lady turned out to be the jolliest ever the very first time we sat down to dinner and the steward filled her glass with champagne that director's yacht was a regular floating waldorf astoria she winks at me and says what's the use to borrow trouble mr flycop here's hoping you may live to eat the hen that scratches on your grave there was a piano on board and she sat down to it and sung better than you give up two cases to hear plenty times she knew about nine operas clear through she was sure enough bon ton and swell she wasn't one of the among others present kind she belonged on the special mention list the old man too perked up amazingly on the way he passed the cigars and says to me once quite chipper out of a cloud of smoke mr o'day somehow i think the republic company will not give me the much trouble guard well the grip valise of the money mr o'day for that it must be returned to them that it belongs when we finish to arrive when we landed in new york i phoned to the chief to meet us in that director's office we got in a cab and went there i carried the grip and we walked in and i was pleased to see that the chief had got together that same old crowd of monkey bugs with pink faces and white vests to see us march in i set the grip on the table there's the money i said and your prisoner said the chief i pointed to mr warfield and he stepped forward and says the honour of a word with you sir to explain he and the chief went into another room and stayed ten minutes when they came back the chief looked as black as a ton of coal did this gentleman he says to me have this valise in his possession when you first saw him he did said i the chief took up the grip and handed it to the prisoner with a bow and says to the director crowd do any of you recognize this gentleman they all shook their pink faces allow me to present he goes on senor miraflores president of the republic of anchuria the senor has generously consented to overlook this outrageous blunder on condition that we undertake to secure him against the annoyance of public comment it is a concession on his part to overlook an insult for which he might claim international redress i think we can gratefully promise him secrecy in the matter they all gave him a pink nod all round o'day he says to me as a private detective you're wasted in a war where kidnapping governments is in the rules you'd be invaluable come down to the office at eleven i knew what that meant so that's the president of the monkeys says i well why couldn't he have said so wouldn't it jar you end of chapter seventeen recording by eric metzler albuquerque new mexico united states of america
Chapter 18 of Cabbages and Kings by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eric Metzler. The Vitagraphoscope. Vaudeville is intrinsically episodic and discontinuous. Its audiences do not demand denouements. Sufficient unto each turn is the evil thereof. No one cares how many romances the singing comedienne may have had if she can capably sustain the limelight and a high note or two. The audiences reck not if the performing dogs get to the pound the moment they have jumped through their last hoop. They do not desire bulletins about the possible injuries received by the comic bicyclist who retires head first from the stage in a crash of property chinaware. Neither do they consider that their seat coupons entitle them to be instructed whether or no there is a sentiment between the lady solo banjoist and the Irish monologist. Therefore, let us have no lifting of the curtain upon a tableau of the united lovers, backgrounded by defeated villainy and derogated by the comic, osculating maid and butler, thrown in as a sop to the cerberi of the fifty-cent seats. But our program ends with a brief turn or two and then to the exits. Whoever sits the show out may find, if he will, the slender thread that binds together, though ever so slightly, the story that, perhaps, only the walrus will understand. Extracts from a letter from the first vice-president of the Republic Insurance Company of New York City to Frank Goodwin of Coralio, Republic of Anchuria. My dear Mr. Goodwin, your communication per Messrs. Howland and Fourche of New Orleans has reached us, also their draft on New York for one hundred thousand dollars, the amount abstracted from the funds of this company by the late J. Churchill Warfield, its former president. The officers and directors unite in requesting me to express to you their sincere esteem and thanks for your prompt and much appreciated return of the entire missing sum within two weeks from the time of its disappearance. Can assure you that the matter will not be allowed to receive the least publicity. Regret exceedingly the distressing death of Mr. Warfield by his own hand, but congratulations on your marriage to Miss Warfield. Many charms winning manners, noble and womanly nature, and envied position in the best metropolitan society. Cordially yours, Lucius E. Applegate, First Vice President, The Republic Insurance Company. The Vitagraphoscope, Moving Pictures The Last Sausage Scene An artist's studio. The artist, a young man of prepossessing appearance, sits in a dejected attitude, amid a litter of sketches, with his head resting upon his hand. An oil stove stands on a pine box in the center of the studio. The artist rises, tightens his waist belt to another hole, and lights the stove. He goes to a tin bread box, half hidden by a screen, takes out a solitary link of sausage, turns the box upside down to show that there is no more, and chucks the sausage into a frying pan which he sets upon the stove. The flame of the stove goes out, showing that there is no more oil. The artist, in evident despair, seizes the sausage in a sudden access of rage and hurls it violently from him. At the same time a door opens, and a man who enters receives the sausage forcibly against his nose. He seems to cry out, and is observed to make a dance step or two, vigorously. The newcomer is a ruddy-faced, active, keen-looking man, apparently of Irish ancestry. Next he is observed to laugh immoderately. He kicks over the stove. He claps the artist, who is vainly striving to grasp his hand, vehemently upon the back. Then he goes through a pantomime which to the sufficiently intelligent spectator reveals that he has acquired large sums of money by trading pot-metal hatchets and razors to the Indians of the Cordillera Mountains for gold dust. He draws a roll of money as large as a small loaf of bread from his pocket, and waves it above his head, while at the same time he makes pantomime of drinking from a glass. The artist hurriedly secures his hat, and the two leave the studio together. THE WRITING ON THE SANDS SCENE THE BEACH AT NICE A woman, beautiful, still young, exquisitely clothed, complacent, poised, reclines near the water, 
idly scrawling letters in the sand with the staff of her silken parasol. The beauty of her face is audacious. Her languid pose is one that you feel to be impermanent. You wait expectant for her to spring or glide or crawl like a panther that has unaccountably become stock still. She idly scrawls in the sand, and the word that she always writes is Isabel. A man sits a few yards away. You can see that they are companions, even if no longer comrades. His face is dark and smooth and almost inscrutable, but not quite. The two speak little together. The man also scratches on the sand with his cane, and the word that he writes is Anchuria. And then he looks out where the Mediterranean and the sky intermingle with death in his gaze. THE WILDERNESS AND THOU SCENE The borders of a gentleman's estate in a tropical land. An old Indian with a mahogany-colored face is trimming the grass on a grave by a mangrove swamp. Presently he rises to his feet and walks slowly toward a grove that is shaded by the gathering, brief twilight. In the edge of the grove stand a man who is stalwart, with a kind and courteous air, and a woman of a serene and clear-cut loveliness. When the old Indian comes up to them, the man drops money in his hand. The grave tender, with the stolid pride of his race, takes it as his due, and goes his way. The two in the edge of the grove turn back along the dim pathway, and walk close, close. For, after all, what is the world at its best but a little round field of the moving pictures, with two walking together in it? End of chapter 18 Recording by Eric Metzler, Albuquerque, New Mexico, United States of America End of Cabbages and Kings by O. Henry